Valiant Ambition tells a story that really covers four years. It begins in the summer of 1776 with a huge British invasionary force about to descend upon Long Island in New York uh, with Washington uh, in his first opportunity as a uh, leading a large army in battle, and he suffers the ignominy of the Battle of Long Island. And eventually the British will take not only Long Island, but New York and forcing the Continental Army to retreat. Uh, eventually all the way to the, the Delaware River. And it starts there and then quickly goes almost simultaneously uh, in chapter two to Benedict Arnold. Now that uh, America has lost New York, the only thing between uh, the British and ultimate victory in, in uh, creating a pincer movement where the British Army in New York will meet up with this other invasionary force coming down from Canada along the uh, length of the Lake Champlain is an American fleet of about 15 vessels led by Benedict Arnold. And uh, if the British can punch their way through that fleet to Fort Ticonderoga, take it, and then go down the Hudson and link up with General, British General Howe in New York, the war will be effectively over. And so Arnold, in the Battle of Valcour Island, fights this incredible uh, engagement, which he fights the British to a draw, even though he's against uh, an army, a, a fleet that's more than twice the size, and saves the day for the moment, and sets up what will become the Battle of Saratoga a year later. And the book follows these two men. Uh, we begin with Washington at his lowest, Arnold at his highest, and we watch over the course of the next four years as Arnold uh, uh, after almost losing his life, the Battle of Saratoga descends into the decision that uh, rather than fight for his nation, it's time uh, to become a traitor, uh, that the best thing he can do for his country and himself is to let the British win while we see Washington, after stumbling in New York, become that indispensable man. Uh, the, the only person that's holding the, the country together. And I think what I was, the story I'm really trying to tell here is that you know, we think of the revolution as being these moments that uh, Trenton, uh, Princeton, Valley Forge, and then Yorktown and we won. The fact of the matter is this war went on year after year after year. The American people began to, to lose faith uh, in, in the, the, the the battle they had begun in 1775 and 76. And it was really only Washington holding what was barely a country together. And so, uh, and so I take it to that moment when Arnold, uh, who's now commander in the fall of 1780 of West Point, uh, decides to attempt to turn that over to the British. And this would have, could have been the, the ultimate blow when America was at its lowest ebb and it, it fails, and, um, and we, we see Washington as the true leader that is the only one holding the country together. Well, you know, this book, like all my books, are just full of surprises. I mean, for me, uh, I was amazed that, you know, we all know the revolution had to be as long as it was, given the dates. Uh, but, you know, we focus on pivotal battlefield points and lose the fact that this went on for years. And it's not the, the Bing Bang Valley Forge and then Yorktown and it's done. It's this long, terrible slog that causes people to really doubt themselves. You know, it's, it's a tough story. It's not pretty. Uh, and yet, for me, uh, the great surprise in this was how much it, it increased my respect for Washington. Um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't just Washington leading at certain points, it was Washington just being there, having the confidence, just never giving up. And so, and for me also, uh, I was surprised at how much sympathy I had for, for uh, Arnold. Uh, you know, I, we all grow up thinking of him as this terrible traitor, an awful person from the start who was hiding it. Um, and, and, but the fact of the matter was, yes, he was a volatile personality. There are character flaws that were there from the beginning. But a lot of bad, undeserved stuff happened to him. And, um, and this was a terribly long struggle. 
someone like Washington, only a few like Washington were able to surmount it and ultimately rise above. Arnold, uh, through his volatility, surrendered to those dark forces. And for me, that was the fascinating th thing, to see the parallax view, to see Washington and Arnold, and see that you know, where one goes is here and goes this way, Washington goes there. And so they, they basically end in, in inverted uh, positions. And for me, that was a surprise that really personalized uh, what it was this long grinding uh, uh, evolution of us as, as a country, a very painful birth. Well, you know, in researching this book, it became clear that a dysfunctional Congress is nothing new. Uh, and, and in truth, the Continental Congress had been put in a difficult, if not impossible, situation with no executive branch to the government uh, and with no ability to directly tax the people. The Continental Congress was expected to lead the national government uh, without money uh, and uh, without an ability to reach decisions, really. Everything was put into a committee, and anyone who has worked with committees knows that um, they, they can come up with proposals but are, have a difficult time putting them in place. And so the Continental Congress uh, was a very difficult place to serve. We think of it as the place where that generated the, the Declaration of Independence, and at that time, the best and the brightest were in the Continental Congress. However, after that, in the years after 1776, the best hearts and minds in the country moved back to the states, or uh, like Benjamin Franklin, uh, went abroad to, as diplomats. And so uh, the quality of people in the Continental Congress was not what it had been. And they didn't have the money, they just, they didn't have the political structure to govern effectively. And what happened was uh, they were very prone in this situation to uh, infighting, to political factions. Uh, there was a large uh, faction from New England, a very powerful faction, that began to lose faith uh, in George Washington after he lost Philadelphia to the British. They also distrusted the fact that he was emerging as that one great public figure. And, you know, they had uh, rejected a monarch and in Washington, they saw a, another potential monarch. And so there was great distrust, not only Washington, but his army, because they feared, uh, given uh, the, the Roman models, uh, and in England during the Civil War, that the military leader might, in one case, take charge and, and, and end up ruling the country. And so uh, they were Washington's boss, and the incredible thing is Washington, uh, from the very beginning, was dedicated to the principle that if this republic was going to survive, it had to be governed by its civil leaders. And so he, this put him in the position of being second-guessed by a legislative body with little to no military experience that really could not figure out where it was going. And yet somehow he had the patience resolved and stamina to see it through. Benedict Arnold uh, was a merchant, horse trader, former apothecary from uh, New Haven, Connecticut. And uh, he, was, uh, he had been a mariner, had, had gone down to uh, the Caribbean, up to the St. Lawrence, and, and really knew uh, not only America by water, but um, all sorts of trade routes and things like that. And he was a, very much a patriot. And uh, when he heard about uh, Lexing Lexington and Concord, uh, he, he led a, a company uh, from New Haven to Boston and convinced uh, the, the authorities there that the key to the north was taking Fort Ticonderoga. There were all sorts of cannons there that would be very helpful to the cause. It was poorly defended, and he should be the one to do it. Unfortunately, from Arnold's perspective, Ethan Allen had the same idea. The two formed an uneasy alliance, took Fort Ticonderoga, and this began a real incredible rise for Arnold. He then led an overland uh, march to Quebec uh, through the wilderness of Maine, 
Uh, he, he then uh, led the retreat uh, from Montreal into, into Lake Champlain and eventually uh, fought the, the Battle of Valcour Island, which made him a real hero. And so uh, he, he, he was great, a great battlefield commander. He had magnificent instincts in battle, but he was a fiery personality. And if you were serving with him, you'd love him. Uh, if, you, if you were an officer trying to work cooperatively with him, there was a good chance that you would have a different opinion. And he was uh, not a very politic man. He made enemies very easily. And so he was a constant source of controversy. And, uh, so, uh, and yet he had genuine talents. Uh, he could be, uh, and Washington recognized those talents. But he also realized that uh, uh, Arnold was the aggressive person uh, that he was and that there were certain dangers attached to that. Well, Arnold had a talent for the dramatic. Um, throughout his career, uh, you know, if there was a swashbuckling way to end a battle, if there was a risk uh, that looked crazy uh, to more objective people but would deliver you know, that, that flourish at the end, he was all for it. And this, the drama of turning over West Point appealed to him immensely. And he was the one, he really felt that he was the only one who could save his country in 1780 from the abyss that it had fallen into. And so from his perspective, even after the treason was revealed, he, in an incredibly worded letter to Washington, um, to the very end, has absolutely no remorse. Uh, he was doing it for his country. The fact of the matter was that, he, however, uh, he did he only did it after he had negotiated a very sweet deal with the British. You know, he could have, like Robert E. Lee, said, I've reached the point where I, I feel I must turn to the other side. He could have done that, and, um, and people could have said, well, he did it for, the, for reasons beyond uh, personal ones, but he didn't. Uh, he, he made sure to negotiate the best possible deal, and, uh, and he ultimately did it for the money. Arnold and Washington, you know, it's surprising to us today. We think of Washington as this careful, uh, pragmatic leader, you know, who will not take unnecessary chances. But there's a part of him that was very much like Arnold. And I think, you know, Arnold was in many ways what Washington could have been if he was 10 years younger and not saddled with the, uh, the terrible responsibility of command. You know, he could have gone in there and been that kind of battlefield hero that worked miracles on the battlefield. I mean, that, that I think was a kind of fantasy for, for Washington, but he couldn't, of course, he realized he couldn't do that as, as commander in chief. And so he had, I think, great um, sympathy uh, and respect for Arnold as a warrior. And uh, he, he, he realized he could carry it too far, but I, you know, he lacked those kinds of military figures uh, in his army. He desperately needed someone like an Arnold. And I think it created kind of a blind spot for him. And Washington was, unlike Arnold, a very trusting person by personality. You know, he gave his, the people he trusted, he trusted, he, gave, he had to, or he couldn't have created a, a functioning army. And, and so Arnold caught, you know, it wasn't until, Arnold caught a lot of people by surprise, but uh, Washington in particular. And yet I think one of Washington's greatest moments is after he learns of Arnold's attempt uh, to turn over West Point. You know, everyone around him is fulminate with outrage. And Washington, you can tell, is feeling this. But he writes this incredible uh, letter to his French counterpart, Rochambeau, uh, putting it in a immense perspective. You know, here he is in the midst of all of this. His, one of his best generals has just tried, has gone to the British and he says, you know, the remarkable thing is here we are, um, this new republic in the middle of a battle. And the remarkable thing is there haven't been more attempts like this. And, you know, and he was able to see the long view while people around him are, are surrendering to their passions. He, through his force of personality and character, a character that he has been um, creating all his life, um, uh, is able to contain that and to turn those energies to, in a positive and ultimately constructive direction. Uh, 
Arnold, Arnold was magnificently self-confident. And, um, and the, the same traits that made him a great battlefield commander, uh, that he was always right and he would survive no matter what, made him a great traitor. He did not see himself as a traitor. He had become so disillusioned with Congress, with what was happening to the American people, that he felt that the ultimate patriotic act would be to end his country's misery and to bring back the British. And so he did not see himself as a traitor. He saw himself as the ultimate patriot. And completely in keeping with his character, uh, where you know, he had ultimate self-confidence, which could serve him magnificently on the battlefield when others were losing their resolve. Uh, it led him to commit uh, the most uh, risky act, you could argue, of the revolution of turning traitor to the country that he had supported for all that time. And once again, he never saw himself as a traitor. He saw himself as his country's potential great deliverer. Yes, well, Arnold was clearly one of America's great battlefield generals. And Continental Congress, being a political body, awarded promotions to major generals. And they, in their wisdom, decided that rather than elevate Arnold, who clearly deserved the promotion to major general, that they would promote five junior uh, brigadier generals past him. Uh, and uh, this was done for political, political reasons, because they wanted each state to have the same number of major generals, but it was really a terrible blow to Arnold, and uh, some have accused him of being thin-skinned about it, but just about any officer in the, put in that position would have been outraged. And uh, he complained to Congress, and in his usual impolitic way, uh, added to the controversy, uh, then went to fight eventually at Saratoga, uh, where he almost lost his leg, and he was already embittered. And now, uh, after uh, suffering the trauma of not only that injury, but being treated in a terrible manner by Horatio Gates, who got all the credit for you, the victory that you could argue was primarily uh, Arnold was responsible for, he began to question, why was he doing this? Uh, he had also lost what he considered to be a vast fortune to the cause. Uh, he, eventually, his leg would mend to the point that he could serve as military governor of Philadelphia once the British evacuated. And this, unfortunately, this was about the worst position for a man of Arnold's uh, disposition. And he was embroiled in constant controversy, ran afoul of the Continental Congress and the, the state legislature, uh, and uh, court-martial proceedings were eventually brought against him. He fell in love and married a, a beautiful young loyalist, Peggy Shippen. And uh, soon after that, he began to think maybe uh, this country is not worth it, and maybe it's time I explored the possibility of becoming a traitor. And, uh, and so over the course, it wouldn't, wouldn't happen immediately, but over the course of the next couple of years, he eventually maneuvered it, it so that he was put in charge of West Point. And, and that's when uh, Valiant Ambition uh, focuses for its final conclusion. Arnold and Peggy Shippen, they loved each other. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And, I, and for me, it was John Adams who provided some wonderful pr perspective on it. At one point, uh, when uh, America is trying to figure out, do we, do we become an independent nation? And so it was dividing Congress. Those who were more conservative said, no, Declaration of Independence, those who said we should. And he was recounting how uh, friends of his on the other side, their wives, were loyalists and how impossible it would have been for him if his wife did not support him in his views. And for me, that was speaking exactly uh, to what was happening uh, to, to Arnold. Peggy Shippen came from, uh, although her father, parents were trying not to express their views politically because they had to weather a British administration and then an American administration, Peggy was clear that you know she wished that it was the way when the, the British Army was occupying Philadelphia. She had great sympathies for that. And so, you know, and her husband was tr being treated terribly uh, by the Continental Congress, by the uh, legislative body in Philadelphia. He had suffered so much that, you know, I think um, they had a, a marriage uh, and it created a situation that uh, fostered uh, Arnold's, all his inst worst instincts when it came to his ability 
to see the struggle in long terms rather than personal terms. All my books are about leadership in one way or another. And in Washington, I see the ultimate leader, uh, someone who can actually learn from his experience. You know, we all think we can learn from our experience, but in reality, we are pretty much who we are from the very beginning. And um, with Washington, he was a very fiery personality, a, a personality at the, in the beginning of his life that was surprisingly close to Arnold. Um, he was a very, when it came to the battlefield, his natural inclinations were very aggressive. Uh, and throughout the arc of the story I tell in Valiant Ambition, he, Washington really learns that for the good of his country, even though it is contrary to what, how he would like to be as a military commander, he has to fight a defensive war, a war of posts. And uh, you know, this just drives him crazy. It's not the way he wants to do it. He wants to take that bold stroke that ends this war quickly because he recognizes more than anyone that uh, this country is in danger of falling apart. And yet you see him stumble several times, but ultimately he realizes the only way he's going to see this through, the only way that they're going to outlast the British is if he fights a defensive war. And so you see Washington um, evolve as a leader and develop incredible political skills where it's interesting, while he learns militarily he needs to fight a defensive war, he takes, uh, when it comes to his, his political uh, management of Congress, of, of rivals in the army, he proves to be a, you know, a very uh, astute and when he needs to be, uh, aggressive political uh, insider. And so um, uh, Washington in those four years um, evolves in, in remarkable ways. And, uh, and so that at the point when Arnold threatens to dissolve this country, uh, Washington, I feel, has reached the point where um, he is the one uh, through a sheer force of personality and determination is holding it together. Well, you know, we think of the revolution as America against Britain. And the fact of the matter is, uh, it, it devolved to the point where the real battle was within. America, after the Battle of Saratoga, the French come in, many Americans think, ah, oh, we've won it. And nothing happens to really uh, promote the cause against the British. And the American people begin to lose faith in that and turn their uh, attention inward, fighting among themselves. Loyalist against patriot, often neighbor against neighbor, and just a squalid, desperate uh, civil war uh, that really has nothing to do with ideals uh, and is just a, a desperate battle for survival. And uh, Americans had really lost uh, the fervor with which this had all begun. And, and I think we don't understand that, that, that we think we were united through all this, but we weren't. Uh, we really began to lose our way. And the great irony is Arnold's treason awoken many people to the fact that the war was theirs to lose. And so, um, uh, you know, this is a different kind of revolution, I think, for many readers.